The great 18th century French mathematician, Pierre Simon Laplace, once said, you want me to predict everything? Fine. Tell me everything. <laughs> you think about the kind of techniques we're going to have soon, and you see that with data mining and electronic agents and knowledge mapping, we're going to be quite close to what Laplace was talking about, maybe within our lifetime, or certainly yours, with the ability to know what's going on at the science, technology, social interface, and to predict outcomes across a range and at a level of detail, orders of magnitude greater than ever before, and what we might able, be able to do with that will alter the process of innovation itself. That's fine, except, of course, in the short term after that, we're still left with the question, as everybody out there gets the technology, and they're able to do what we can do, how will we keep our markets, how will we keep our jobs, how will we keep our standard of living? Well, I think most people agree that in the face of this short-term problem, diminishing Western support for pure research needs to be reversed, because ultimately that's the kind of research that has in the past created entirely new markets in the 19th century. People laughed at Scots physicist James Dewar when he kept a bubble uh, inflated for, for three years. Uh, the net result of Dewar's noodling with surface tension was cling film and the entire packaging industry. The double helix of DNA was revealed by somebody who was noodling with coal crystals. Electricity came out of studies of magnetism. Now, the negative reaction to funding blue sky research like that is often expressed, what use is it? But as Benjamin Franklin once said, when somebody said about the new hot air balloons the French were flying, what use are they? He said, what use is a newborn baby? Put together pure research with knowledge maps and data mining and electronic agents, and you have another intriguing possibility with regard to keeping up in the innovation economy. You might be able to go beyond innovation to some kind of innovation template. Now, I suggest this because back in the 40s, the great American mathematician Norbert Wiener said, change comes most of all, from the unvisited no man's land between the disciplines, between the silos. Knowledge webs make available and accessible the no man's land between different fields and encourage collaboration. That's the job of knowledge webs. So could it be that knowledge mapping might facilitate interdisciplinary initiatives that would be able to help people break out of the old silos, more readily cross the barriers between one area of expertise and another, or one agency and another? make redundant the old reductionist turf wars that prevented different agencies and disciplines from sharing what they knew. It's no risky new exercise. We've done it before, but back then we did it by accident. I mean, in the early 20th century, in the no man's land between physics and botany came molecular biology. But those things happened in a relatively empty and slow world. world. Today there's no time anymore for that kind of serendipitous approach. The ripple effects of change are now so complex so interactive, so global, we can no longer afford to leave innovation entirely to accident of circumstances. Don't get me wrong, I am not suggesting some kind of discredited, centralised government control over innovation. That approach only ever worked in the world of the past when we all lived under mushroom-growing governance. You know, keep them in the dark and feed them a load of horse manure. <laughs> in some places it's still true. <coughs> But with predictive access and virtual testing environments and agent-mediated direct social and political involvement by every member of a knowledge web educated community, we might be able to rethink those backward-looking institutions. We might be able to go beyond leaving social decisions to the over-simple ideologies of so-called leaders, to go beyond the crude win-or-die strategies of the marketplace. Above all, to revise the old idea that innovation only happens with specialist knowledge on a big scale, with big bucks. With the kind of information coming soon to a brain near you, that may no longer be true anymore. But we need to move fast if we are to prepare, because as Yogi Berra said, the future isn't what it used to be. Above all, perhaps, thanks to nano and biotechnology, which are going to take us through the most radical change in history when they move us from a culture of scarcity to a culture of abundance, which they will likely do in your lifetimes. A couple of simple examples, I'm sure you know it all. There is already a prototype spray-on solar energy nanomaterial, painted or sprayed on your house, your car, your clothing, any object, and you just independently powered that object, whatever it is, even on a cloudy day. Use that sort of solar energy on floating platforms at sea to take hydrogen from water and carbon from the CO2 in the air and run these two gases over a catalyst and you get all the oil you might ever want, if, that is, you still need oil. 
Nanotechnology offers the possibility of a coin-sized battery lasting six months to run your electric car. Nano turbines will st store excess wind energy for when it's needed. Engineered bacteria will clean up polluted soil and make any water drinkable. Quantum supercomputers will work on chips the size of a moat of dust. Intelligent consumer articles of all kinds will inventory and manage your personal living. Medication targeting accurate to a single cell could cure most diseases. Fertilizers built into the seed will help to feed the world. All this and much more is likely within the next 40 years. And that's no time. I mean, the plane you came here in was probably 40 years old. But it, the clincher in nanotechnology seems to be that four years ago for the first time, a couple of Japanese guys built a molecule out of individual atoms. And there are already early designs for what is being called a personal nanofactory, a box in your house. You download the right atomic manipulating software and the machine manufactures atom by atom from the bottom up with unprecedented precision anything you want using for feedstock the atoms to be found in air and dirt. It makes anything, light bulbs, clothing, gold, oil, water, food, weapons, solar power, the philosopher's stone, Star Trek. And what that could do to the world, that virtually free abundance of anything a person might want, will make the social effects of the Industrial Revolution look like child's play. Just a couple of questions that abundance will raise within your lifetime. When any, every individual has a machine, because sooner or later the hackers will get you the software for nothing, and the machine, of course, will make copies of itself. <laughs> when every individual has the machine, and every individual is virtually entirely self-sufficient, what need for government, or commerce, or nation states, or globalization, or any of this old world we live in? Without trade, who needs businesses? So what happens to work? What do people do? What happens to our social dynamics when, thanks to targeted drugs, the vast majority of the population are over 65 and heading healthily towards 100 and something? If there is no need to go and grab raw materials, is that the end of war? But with no more international economic pressure to toe the line, will tin pot dictators with nano weapons go to war for some other reason? Will we look back fondly to the time when all we had to worry about was a few terrorists? When quantum computers built of DNA give every individual the entire store of human knowledge on a single knowledge web, will it be necessary to know anything anymore? And if not, what will you do with your brain? When nobody needs any longer to conform to rules imposed by scarcity, what happens to what we used to call agreed standards and values? If that's some of what's coming, maybe we need to start rethinking about rethinking our institutions. Instead of using technology just to make them do what they've always done, only cheaper and faster. Think beyond building better mousetraps, like high-speed trains, clean coal, government without walls, transparent banks, billions on Medicare and smart power grids, the next generation of stealth bombers, and so on. Take a look instead at the prime key problem to solve. What will we do to replace the answer to lousy roads and no telecommunications in the 18th century, what we call representative democracy. 300 years ago, you find two fools with a horse and time to spare, and you send them out the dangerous, lousy, bandit-ridden roads to the capital to speak for you. Those roads are so unpleasant, they're not going to come back the next day and say, have you changed your political minds? Over a number of decades, we come to know these horse-owning adventurers as politicians and their return journeys as elections. Today we have perfect roads and telecom up the yin-yang and the same lumbering 18th century representative system which is no longer representative because we are no longer a bunch of illiterate, out-of-touch peasants. Well, some of us. <laughs> what we need, among many other things, is perhaps to start thinking about electronic agent-mediated direct democracy and how to process the decisions made every second of every day by millions of empowered, electronically enfranchised individuals, each of whom is entirely resource autonomous. The end of ideology. Now in all this, and I'm finishing, at least the one thing I think you can be sure of, in terms of the future not being the same, is that whatever physical shape it takes, whatever infrastructure or lack of there is, 
one thing material abundance I don't think will automatically provide. And it'll be something which will give those individuals and communities who have it an edge over those who don't. And that's new ideas. The natural byproduct of every one of those 35,893,799 Californian brains lying around the place waiting to be used. If we can only get on very soon with finding means to bring them in from the cold, to tap the tremendous power, the tremendous pool of potential talent they represent, so that we can then make use of a future universal knowledge web, perhaps to create an entirely new form of social construct, facilitated by the kind of person we have not seen since the 15th century, the kind of guy who used to be known as Renaissance man, the guy who knew everything there was to know. This time round, the new Renaissance person, who may perhaps be your next generation replacement, won't know everything, but they'll know how to know what's required, when required, how to take this synoptic view of the way everything connects from the overall level of general trends down to the smallest zoomed in detail of predictable change, predicting change, and advising the general population where and when to direct their decision-making attention in an exercise, perhaps, of the first true informed direct democracy in history, what your founding fathers would have called mob rule. Sounds like a bit of a free-for-all. I would argue it will be the first free for all in history, an arrangement through which we might finally free ourselves from the top-down, reductionist way up to now we have so far handled the challenges of innovation by sticking, hunkering down in our silos, wearing our blinkers, holding tight to standard operating procedures, and generally employing the management technique known as the skyscraper approach. You know, that of the guy who falls off the top of a skyscraper. As he's falling past the 75th floor, somebody calls out to ask him how he's doing. And he shrugs his shoulders, and now falling past the 55th floor says, so far, so good. <laughs>